This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast where we watch sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, First Wave, Season 2, Episodes 1 and 3. Remember the fundamental lesson which once guided our military conduct. Battle must be waged only when the moral force of right is behind us. That's correct. Our planet is dying. We have to find new habitat or die with it. That's why we're here. We chose a planet populated by what we believed was an inferior species. We were mistaken. Welcome to Continue and Drag, the podcast you listen to on your pocket computer. I'm Luke, <laughs> here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an alien. <laughs> <laughs> was that in this episode? I also forgot yeah. that. Yeah, it was in the second episode where the guy said, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an alien. And I was like... Okay, close enough. <laughs> great line, great line. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nailed it. Well, Jordan, as I'm sure you know, it's our holiday episode. Oh no, I didn't know. Tis the season. <laughs> I'll say this in my defense of every year because it's not actually Christmas because we're recording this ahead of time. So how am I supposed to know? I this couldn't in the possibly calendar. look at. I, I was just gonna say I couldn't possibly look at the calendar and see when this is coming out. <laughs> I believe it's highlighted as holiday episode. <laughs> Is it? Oh, okay, yeah, I haven't looked. But you know what that means, Jordan? It's time for an annual gift exchange. Yeah. And you know you know what's funny, uh, Luke? Uh, uh, I did... Now, I don't know if anyone is, remembers, but Luke and I are now in different countries and in very different time zones. Um, but uh, yesterday I received my, my gift. I, I And I didn't know what it was. So I did open it, and I and I do I do have my gift. So I do know what I got for my gift exchange, but I can't do an actual unboxing now because I I just thought maybe someone sent me a bomb in the mail. <laughs> so you've been holding on to it all the time. Well, I was just like, should I open this? Should I open this? But I was like, ah, well, you got to go some way. <laughs> but 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 Luke's hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point. Well, this year I got Jordan a Misfits of Science t-shirt so he can yeah. fit in with those Misfits. That was their uniform, right? They just wore a t-shirt with their logo on it or something? It was, they, yeah, they wore that and then they had like, I don't know, I think they wore like sweatpants. That's great though. Thank you very much. It's very No, funny. no worries. No worries. I was uh, trying to think of what to get you, the man who has everything. And I was just like, this is it. This has to be it. And don't worry, in the next three years, something will arrive there in Korea for you. Oh yeah? You won't spoil it for me? That's going to be a surprise? <laughs> no, no. It'll be a surprise. I was a little disappointed. It was a real touch and go because we are recording this early and like having to get the logistics right. I wasn't sure if it was going to get there in time. And when I woke up this morning, I saw it arrive. I'm like, ah, I did it. Yeah, it was very good timing because it was yesterday. This morning for this guy. Oh, this morning for you. Yeah. Anyways, that's yeah, great. I'll uh, I'll be bringing it on vacation with me. I was, I was hoping you'd be wearing it, but that's okay. The Mexican people will enjoy it more. Yeah. Well, don't tell everyone my vacation. They'll follow me. <laughs> it's a, such a small country. They'll track you. <laughs> also, this podcast will come out long after you're back. <laughs> long after I'm back. Yeah. So there you go, people. You won't be able to find me. But if you were looking for me, I- I'm the pale one on the beach. Okay. Well, let's give them your home address then so they can. <laughs> <laughs> and next. <laughs> well, moving on with the show, Jordan. I hear you have a segment for us. A little birdie told me you might have prepared a little something yeah. for us to do. Yeah, I was that birdie. So it's been a little while uh, since we've done this, but I, I, we've finally done a show that people, there seems to be a community of people that like this show. And when people really like a show, there's there's a few things we know what they do. One, they write fan fiction. Two, they do dr- new drawings of people. Um, and because this is a uh, audio medium, I can't show you new drawings of the two... Uh, of the leads kissing or whatever. So Wait, we're going to read kissing? fan fiction. Kate and Crazy Eddie? Uh, yeah, uh, that would the only people I would assume would be kissing. Now I'm going to think about that all night. Touching bits and bobs, you know? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I have uh, three, all, three short stories. Um, I'm going to give you the title. You can pick one, and I'll do a little reading from them. Okay, well, I botched this the last time we did it, so I'm a little worried. <laughs> 
Okay, so here's... Now, I'll say this again. I have uh, not read any of these, so I can't... I don't know if they're funny. I don't know if they're sexy. I don't know if they're badly written. I don't know if they're a uh, piece of poetry. I don't know. So this is all on you. So, But I'll give you the titles, and, and we'll see what happens. You've done no preparation. Well, I just... I like I like it being a little bit... Uh, I like struggling through it when I have to read it for the first time, you know? Fair enough. So uh, I, they're all they're all about the same length. That's that's the uh, that's the effort I did, as opposed to like a like fifty thousand uh, word story. These are all these are all kind of short. So the first one is called "Missing Scene from Mabus." Now this is an episode we didn't watch, but someone has written a scene in the episode. Like during the commercial break, it was a scene they think should have been added. Okay, so that's one. Second episode is called Three Year Requiem," and the last one is called "A Letter from Eddie." Okay, I'm not watching a missing scene from an episode I didn't watch, so... I figured. And Three Year Requiem just sounds like Better a... Better title. It sounds like a real drag. Yeah? So, we're gonna do a letter from Eddie, I think. A letter from Eddie. Let me pull it up. I think you probably made the right choice. Okay. So, a letter from Eddie. This is written by a writer named Holly C. And uh, she has written... Uh, the, the synopsis is Eddie has written a letter. (laughs) Okay. So here we go. The following is a letter that was delivered to my house by mistake. I think it was intended for a person who lived here before me. There was no return address. So I kept it for a while, then decided to send it to you as a publication. Uh, as your publication deals an unexplained phenomenon, I hope you can make use of it. Okay. I like, I like the start so far. Yeah. Yeah. Dear as Isabel, bet you never thought you'd get a letter from me, huh? This is probably a bit of a shock to you, but don't stop reading, please. I know we parted on bad terms and that you never wanted to hear from me again, but what I've got to tell you is really important. First of all, you've got to know that in spite of all that happened, as I said and did, I never stopped caring about you and never will. I messed up with you real bad. I know that. I do. And after you, there were two others I messed up with as well, for similar <laughs> reasons. <laughs> don't need to add that in the letter, anyone. Our life together seems so far away now. I've been through so much in the years since I last saw you. You know, sometimes I have trouble remembering what you look like, even on our wedding day. I can't even remember what we, uh, where we went on our honeymoon, can you? Now, this is, this is a bad way to start a letter to someone. Don't tell them that. I've had two other marriages since then, and I barely remember yeah. what we did for our honeymoon. Yeah. Uh, but don't worry. It goes on. I have good reasons for writing you. A strong urge to save and protect you. A real good reason which I don't want you to dis- dismiss out of hand. It's hard for me to write a proper uh, to write proper letters. You know that. Letters on paper and in envelopes, but I don't want this intercepting or being read by anyone but you. The things I'm going to tell you won't sit well in an email. Besides, a physical letter is so much more serious and authentic, don't you think? So this letter is to warn you, because in spite of everything I care about, uh, what might happen to you in the future? We had our differences, and I know that when you realized how sick I was, that living with me would be impossible for you i accept that divorce was inevitable Uh uh-huh i'm glad we parted before we had the uh the complication of kids because i would have made a lousy father as much as i made an unreliable husband i hope you have found someone who can be strong for you because you are going to need support in the months to come it almost sounds like a threat doesn't it (laughs) you're probably going to put this all down to my paranoia but let me assure you that i've taken some really good medication which helps me function almost normally Maybe if I had gotten the right treatment earlier, we would still be together. But then I would not have met Cade, and he is the reason I am writing. Not just to you, but for all those I care for. To get to the point, finally, geez. A couple of years ago, I met a guy quite by accident. He came to my Airstream. Yes, yours truly has set up a nomadic lifestyle in a trailer. After reading my publication, The Paranoid Times, which you may have read yourself. Then again, I guess not. You would avoid anything to do with me after the last scene. But I digress. Foster fetched up... Uh, fetched up at my airstream. Is that an expression? Foster fetched up at my airstream in a desperate state. He was, and still is, on the run from the law, having been convicted of a crime he did not commit. I can see you nodding your head at me now and saying, get real, but I believe him. Remember when we saw that in the clip show when they got together at the airstream? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is accurate. So th- so there you go, this is accurate. This is, this is almost as good as watching that clip show. We have been through too much together for me not to believe... It's a long, long story, the one about how I got to trust him, how I know he is telling the truth, when he says he was framed and how we fought the Nostradamus, we found the Nostradamus book. 
To save me from telling you all of this in the letter, you should go look at my website, thepernoidtimes.com, <laughs> and, and, and read Foster's journals there. You'll find so, out why so like he's... Like and subscribe, he, ex-wife. Like and subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You'll find out why he's the twice-blessed man. If you still have any feelings for me, you will do that. It, wow, that's something. I, li- I like the idea of like reaching out to your ex-wife and then in, in the same breath of being like, I barely remember us getting married. Hey, you want to check out this website I'm working on? You should really, you owe it to me to look at my website. Here's what I really like about this is that somebody moved into a house, got a letter to deliver to their house, and that letter is literally from Crazy Eddie, and then she sent it to Crazy Eddie unknowing it was from Crazy It's just like, what are the chances? It's serendipity, Jordan. That's true. That's what this show is all about, serendipity. <laughs> it goes on. For nearly three years now, we have been trying to inter- uh, interpret quatrains from the book and using them to sabotage experiments, alien experience. These are aliens living among us, who look like us, but are secretly preparing for war. This is not my paranoia speaking. I know I used to trouble you with all my tales of government conspiracies, and now I am beginning to sound like the boy who cried wolf. I really don't know what I can write that will convince you that this isn't all in my mind. The reason I am writing, if you are still reading, is to warn you and tell you that my life has gotten significantly more dangerous recently, and I have a feeling that I may not live much longer. I have a real sense of my own morality, uh, morality, a sense of my own mortality. Foster has almost died a couple of times recently. I have seen my world torn apart. The things I have seen would give you nightmares the rest of your life. I don't know if that's true. Believe me, our battle is real. When the second wave comes, it will be your battle also. My friendship with Foster is awesome, and I know with complete certainty that he is the only thing standing between us in complete annihilation. He has a destiny, and that destiny is to save us all or to walk in shadows with his brethren. That is a quote about him from Nostradamus. <laughs> when I have a chance to think about it, I feel privileged, privileged because I am his right man, right hand man, and that I am the one who does his research and matches up quatrains to leads. Sometimes I even get into the field with him to do something active myself, not just sit in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he is the one who will save us from the alien invasion. He is so important to the human race that a woman from the future came back to save his life. Whoa! We haven't watched that episode. Spoiler alert letter. Yeah. In her reality, he was shot dead. He is my best friend, and I have given up my I have given up my life to help him. Last paragraph, Luke. So I just feel I got to warn you to take your loved ones and get out of the city. Go somewhere remote, maybe even leave the country. Go to Bora Bora like like we joked once, remember? <laughs> just get away and keep your head uh, head down because the invasion is coming. Inevitable as winter follows fall. And one more thing. They are here in human form, so don't trust anyone. Your ex, Eddie N. That's the letter. Remember that one time I joked about Bora Bora, but then later I forgot where we went on our honeymoon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's, he remembers all the little things, you know? Fair enough. Uh, you know what? That letter is actually, or that, not letter, but the uh, short story, it's actually not bad. It's very empathetic. I actually kind of enjoyed it. It's it's not the worst thing we've had, read before. Really what it is, though, is like, it's someone trying to just piece together. Like, that ba- basically is just the synopsis of the show, right? Yeah. And they're trying to flesh out, I think, Eddie a little bit. Give him some background. Give him, like, some stakes in the world. Yeah. But uh, he's like, I'm, I like the, the, in the end where he's like, I'm not just a guy who sits on the computer all the time. I'm like, yes, you are. I think the only thing we see him do <laughs> other than this. No, it's not true. In one of these episodes, the first one, he does get in a boat and try to help. He doesn't help. And then in the second episode, he makes a sandwich. <laughs> he said he gets in the field a couple times and we get to see it yeah. this, this week. We did get to see it. Yeah. Well, that was a great, that was a great piece of fan fiction. I'm glad you found that. Thank you. It wasn't sexy. I, listen, the last time we picked one, it was too sexy and too racist. So I'm glad we ended up with this one. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the little spoiler for the uh, for anyone listening is that we had to actually do an edit of it because it got a little too sexy and a little too racist. So yeah, yeah, then we we're gonna cut, cut down quite out. a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that I was reading it live and I was like, "Ooh, uh oh," and I was like, "What are we gonna do about this? This is bad." <laughs> that's what editing's for. Uh, but not this one. It was kind of sweet. Yeah, that's all right. It wasn't so bad. Do you think it's canon that he has three ex-wives? I bet I have a feeling that he probably mentioned it at some point. And someone was like, ooh, something for my story. <laughs> all right. Well, shall we get into it, Jordan? Let's do it. At season two. Yeah, we're, we did it. We get through season one. Now it's time for season two. And here's the I to be summary for season two, episode one, Target 117. Get that? You get it? It's a little play on the first episode, pilot, the pilot episode? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they've nailed it. He was subject 117, now he's target. And- yeah, I got it. All right, all right. <laughs> Foster follows up on a lead to meet someone, but is unaware that the Gua 
have sent a legendary warrior hunter to kill him. Can Foster survive? Uh, yeah. Yeah. L- let me just say a few things. First, in the, uh, uh, between season one and season two, Cade has grown his hair out a little bit. I didn't notice. He used to have, he used to have short, spiky hair. Now he looks e- even more like a soap opera star. He's got, like, he's grown his hair out. And it's a little puffy. He's got a real big head. I will say this in season two. In season one, he was dressed like he was in the Matrix. A trench coat and sunglasses a lot. <laughs> They've at least put him in a leather jacket now. Yeah, he still does wear his sunglasses in that episode where he's riding motorbikes, the next one. Uh, he still sort of looks like he's from the Matrix. But I think they have, they've tried to adjust the look a little bit. Yeah, I think between uh, probably between season one and season two, wasn't there a Columbine? So maybe they had to get him out of that trench coat. Ooh, ooh, ooh yeah. Oh, too soon. I mean, they were really worried they were going to get blamed for it. <laughs> um, so that's the, the first thing I wanted to mention is hair. The second thing is... Um, uh, when we're going to see this Terminator type character, it's really the whole point of the episode is this, like watching this person walk and attack them and also to overly sexualize them with this uh, weird male gaze. Um, did you know who that person was? I I found out when I looked at IMDb. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you for any, any WWE fans, it's Sable. Uh, Arena uh, uh, Lenar or whatever you pronounce it now, uh, or used to be Mero when, when I, when I, in the 90s when I remember her being a thing in wrestling. Seemed like a pretty good get, eh? Sable, this is probably her height, wasn't it? I think this was her height, yeah. So I think this, and honestly, I think it makes sense for what I will argue is a quite bad episode of television and quite a bad episode for them, for this show. I think it really was, they were like, someone ran into a writing the writing room and uh, was like, we've got we've got Sable. Oh, write an episode around. And they're like, oh, I, I don't know. What if she like kind of just walks around? A lot. They're like, yeah, perfect. Perfect episode. <laughs> well, it opens up with a parcel being delivered to Joshua from the uh, Gua. Am I saying that right? The Gua homeworld? The Gua. It's like guac without the C. Oh, thank you. Um, which I liked. It was like uh, it's like a meteorite they I picked up. Too. They open up the top of it and there's just like goo inside. And he reaches in and pulls out like uh, like a silver ball. Yeah, I thought that was that was maybe the best part of the whole episode. Is just I liked how it looked hokey, but it was wonderful. Just the goo, because of course that's how you that's how you, if you want to send like information through space, you send it in a fake meteor filled in goo. Great, perfect, absolutely 10 10. great. It did. I don't. And I'm not sure we talked about this, but it, it reminded me of something they said in the season finale of last of last season, in that they were like they're going to invade Earth using their wormhole technology. And I was like, well, why didn't mm. you just send it via wormhole technology? Why did you shoot it in an asteroid across space? But, you know, t- you know, different technologies, I guess, to get stuff maybe, places. Maybe they shot it in an asteroid through the wormhole, Luke. Come oh, that's now. true. I don't know. I don't know that they didn't. Yeah, there you go. Use your head. I also like that uh, it's a little metal ball. And much like HBO's Westworld, what it is is a digitized personality inside of a ball. Like you put it in the back of a, one of these husks heads, <laughs> just like in Westworld. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, this is operating at the same level as Westworld. But um, uh, anyway, so you see that they have uh, this information. And what we find is it's it's containing the, what would you say, the consciousness the uh, uh, of, 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 one of one of their species. Yes, yes, a great warrior of their species. Lucas. Whose name is Lucas. Classic great warrior not a gr- name. I was just going to say, that's not a good name for a warrior. I assume these are all names that they just, uh, like, it's like when you move to North America and have to pick a white person name. <laughs> right, right. Well, so, I, I don't know, Lucas. Like, you would assume that, but they, they just keep saying Lucas as if, like, I don't know. I like thinking that all the aliens, because the other guy, uh, Joshua, who's going to be in this episode again, uh, Joshua is another name, where I was just like, I like the idea that the aliens just have names like that. <laughs> like, hey, what's your, hey, hey, what's your neighbor again? Greg. Greg the alien. <laughs> But yes, this is where we get to see they're putting they were putting Lucas's personality into the husk of Sable, and man oh man, does it look like a studio note came in because she is so scantily clad, it's insane. Well, to say she's scantily clad, um, she is literally only wearing straps. She's entirely naked, just being uh hung by straps that are just covering her bits and bobs. I realize I think we saw a glimpse of that in the uh, clip show when they found the husk factory. But they yeah, that's true. A lot of lingering happened in this episode. A lot of cameras lingering. Yeah, there's like there's I think at least one scene where she's naked. Maybe two scenes where she's naked for no reason. Uh, and there's another scene where she takes off her top and just walks around in her bra. There's no reason for it. 
But this husk, this husk of sable, was specially designed to have 60% more gua DNA, Jordan. That's right. So I guess I didn't quite understand how it works. I mean, I understand science fiction. But this is this is the first time they've implied that it's more than just wearing... Because they say a husk, which even implies itself. It's just like um, an exterior, right? They're just on the inside. Obviously, there must be some connection because they're you know, they're still seeing through the body and feeling through it. But it seems weird to me the DNA is connected in some way. Do you know? Yeah, I'm a little confused about these husks now. Like, I get the idea that maybe, like, you can take a digital personality is what they say. It's the digital personality. They plug it into a person. And maybe you need a bit of DNA in there for the, like, just the personality to mesh with the body. Like, sure. Okay, like, it's science fiction. I get Mm. that. But last season... Uh, the husk they made of his wife was also full of tentacles and it had exactly. 60% less gua DNA. And we see, we still see that in this season where people have the little tentacles under their skin. So maybe it's just her. Yeah. So that's what I was wondering. I'm like, is, is Lucas the only one who had their, like a digital personality put inside of them? Are the rest of them like full, like gua tentacle monsters who have arrived via wormhole and have like just crawled into husks. And this is the one exception maybe i have a feeling they just for reasons were like this is cool to do but they need her to have 60 percent more gua dna because uh it makes her superhuman yeah so as opposed to um which i should say this does answer one question um i had and i don't know if i brought it up in any of the previous podcasts were are the aliens stronger or do they have different abilities um and i think i don't think they've ever shown them to but i think this if this is canon now will confirm that when they are humans, they have all the abilities of humans. They're not, like, extra strong or extra fast or anything, with the exception of old uh, Lucas. Yes, yes. And Lucas has been sent to Earth after that vote that ended the season one finale. Apparently, the vote right. failed. They decided not to the invasion. And Lucas has been sent here to perform an experiment on Cade. They're going to gather some physiological and neurological data on him while testing him against their, like, greatest warrior. Um, just to, like, I guess, see if the, like, this this human nobility that they talked about in the season finale um, can be overcome with, like, more guas, I guess. Yeah. And and Lucas, uh, Lucas and Joshua seem to have had some sort of past. Joshua, I think they said, and correct me, Luke, if I'm wrong. He trained Lucas, yes. And Lucas then became like this, like legendary warrior. It's sort of like he's become greater than uh, uh, his teacher. Um, but at the same time, they had some sort of relationship. Uh, um, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but I, it's they seem to imply. I think more than imply that they. They had um, uh, some sort of romantic or sexual relationship. Yeah, there's a lot of sexual tension between them. I mean, particularly Lucas is really going for it in that bot, in that husk. Yeah. But like, as as Joshua says, is that like, it's forbidden to have kind of romance between acolytes. And I will give this to Joshua. Like, Lucas is really leaning in there. He, uh, Lucas is trying to get some. And Joshua's like, he's not trying to violate that, that teacher-student bond. He's He's really like, putting a stop to it every time every chance he gets yeah and then lucas in the in the uh uh the sable body is just like i heard sex is really good can, yeah can word is words out on the gua home world <laughs> yeah 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 everyone just is talking about it constantly he actually i believe this is interesting i guess i should call lucas they maybe but uh lucas yes, at they. some point says that on the gua home world sex isn't pleasurable yes they've implied yeah, they've they've sort of implied that because uh, I think they even said like some they've had problems with aliens in, in the previous episodes, uh, sort of getting addicted to sex because um, it's pleasurable, implying that it's not for them, which is a very weird thing for a reproductive society to not have any pleasure. Yeah, I was going to say it's a real um, evolutionary disadvantage to have. <laughs> yeah, but. But, well, they also do mention uh, in this, I don't know if they say their planet's dying, but it's something to that effect. They they say that uh, whether it's their planning is, a planet is collapsing or their society or whatever, that's the reason they've come to Earth because they're looking to take it over and they basically saw a planet full of a weak species, which is what they were saying. Which seems like it's not that weak if you then, they like, they sort of go like, oh, so we saw 40 years ago Earth is really weak. 
then we've hung out for 40 years and allowed, I don't know, their weapons and technology and everything to advance over I, that 40 years. It, you know what I mean? I think you're slightly misunderstanding the line. It, Joshua and Lucas do talk about this. And what it was is their planet is dying. You're correct. But their original research said there was just inferior species on the planet. Like, it, like the idea being like, you know, not sentient perhaps. So that's why they mm. came. And so th- oh, I see. the argument between Joshua and Lucas, I think Joshua and like the Gua in general, is I think he's hung up on this idea that there is a morality to the Gua. And he feels like in their desperation for a new planet, they're breaking that. They're trying to make the humans right. appear inferior, right. even though it's quite clear they're not. Like, I think that's what they're going for now is like this is this is the debate that's happening uh, amongst the Joshua's of the show, basically. Right. But it, now, isn't that a more interesting... That's almost a more interesting show than the show we get, isn't it? Like, a show about aliens trying to <laughs> debate the morality of an invasion of Earth. There's... Now, now maybe not the debate itself is not that interesting. But as a, a jumping-off point, that's kind of interesting. But, like, just take this episode, for example. We're, we're going to get to, like, the next scene, which is basically we're going to see... Cade's going to uh, come up to this, uh, what they're going to keep saying is an island. It's so dark you could barely see anything because he's looking for this guy named Harold Shanley. And very quickly, we're going to get through this stuff. And after this point, the rest of the episode is literally uh, Sable walking slowly to kind of like chase them. And Kate, uh, Cade running behind things and be like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then there's 40 minutes of that. Like, it's like you guys had this whole setup of like actually something interesting that you could talk about. But instead, what they wanted is like a cat and mouse game, but with no, uh, no real cat and mouse struggle. Yeah, whatsoever. I mean, it's a tough one. Uh, well, let's get into kind of the setup for it is the experiment they're putting into motion with Kate is this. Uh, what did you say his name was? Harold Shanley. He uh, has supposedly been sending emails to Cade saying, come yeah. to this island and help me. I, I, I like you, was uh, tricked by the Gua. I killed my children over it, and um, they ruined my yeah. life. And so this brings them to the island because also Nostradamus said something about an Isle of Trade. And they're like, well, that checks out. We got to go to this island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I like almost every episode. I know we're watching, uh, we're not watching every episode in a row, but every episode we see, it seems like the Nostradamus thing is getting smaller and smaller, and the connection more and more tenuous. They're just like, yeah, he mentioned an island once. Anyway, so they go out there. Cade rows across, and like Eddie stays behind. He's just like, don't worry. I vetted all these emails. This is a legitimate guy who needs our help. And I think the second Cade leaves. And he's like, well, I guess I better go verify those emails. Like, he's just like, it's so funny. He's just like, opens up the thing. He looks at the emails. He's like, oh, wait, no, these are all coming from a different IP address directly from the island. I guess it's all a trap. I maybe should have vetted these before I sent him there, even though he said he had before they left. It's insane. He's, he's, and then he's doing the equivalent of um, he's doing the equivalent of uh, uh, sending an email. And then right after sending the email, proofreading it. It was very funny to me, too, because he's like going through his like, he's like going through the code, looking at where it came from. And then he goes, he comes to the island, too, and like corners Cade to warn him later. He's like, it's a trap. And Cade's like, I know already. But he's just like, you don't understand, uh, Cade. If someone were to hack my computer, it's impossible. No man-made computer could hack my system. And I was just like, who do you think you're dealing with? Like, you know, they're what? You know, they're aliens. What do you mean man-made computer? <laughs> Yeah, he's like, yeah, you're right. It wasn't a man-made. It was an alien computer. They hacked you. Also, I think I think his um, he's really tooting his own horn. It's not like he's running some major system. He's running a laptop in an airstream. I know it's so funny. Like, no man-made computer could ever hack my system. I'm like, you're you know you're fighting aliens. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Also, um, like the, again, this episode, this setup as we're here is Kate has has r- rode up to this uh this island at night, and he's like looking for Harold and it seemingly seemingly has had to drive somewhere then get the boat go across it's taking some time and then when um uh, uh what's his face uh, Eddie remembers it's like he's there in five minutes and he rose over he's <laughs> yeah he rose over real fast and so they could be together but uh um but yes uh, the the pocket computer comment you made from the very beginning of the podcast is that Eddie's like he's like the guy emailed me from his pocket computer I was like what the heck's like a pocket computer is that I- a laptop I do love the idea of pocket computers. It comes up a few times this episode, and I was laughing at what a silly term that was. But then I remembered that 
Do you know what? Do you know what uh, your uh, cell phone is called here in uh, in Korea? What's that? It's a handphone. A handphone. Oh, that's funny. So I was like, well, maybe it's not such a silly name. Then. Pocket computer handphone. Sure. Maybe we have the worst term for it now in this in our lives. Yeah. Well, there you go. At any rate, as you're saying, uh, what was named Harold, the guy who they think they're going to save. Uh, Harold Shanley, yeah. He is on the island. They uh, they find him in a shipping container, and he's he's gone completely insane. <laughs> I got a question, though, for you. So this is obviously a trap. Cade knows it's a trap real quick. Eddie knows it's a trap. Uh, the aliens have sent fake emails so that they will come to the island because they think they're having a meeting with this guy, Harold, right? Or they think they're going to be able to talk to him and save him in some way. But why do they bother even putting the real guy there in the island? No idea. Why my not friend. just why not just have like why not just have a trap or have an alien or anything? Why actually go to the trouble of having the real guy? It's not gonna help you in any way. I think that's just so the writers can have a scene where Sable punches through a metal wall and snaps the <laughs> old Harold's neck. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's the only reason. But anyways, that's the point. They they meet this guy, Harold. He's crazy. He thinks they're aliens. He's clearly um it doesn't have some sort of mental issues. He has like post-traumatic stress from dealing with aliens. And then very quickly to show her power, uh, she punch. I love that we're referring to her as Sable, by the way. Uh, she punches her hand through the, through the shipping container and just breaks his neck. And you're like, Oh no, she's really tough. And, and then this starts a series of, by my count, 8 million times she jumps in or walks into a scene and they go, Oh no. And then run away. And that's basically what the rest of the episode is. It really is just that because they set up this idea that like she's an unstoppable force there to yeah. get Cade. And then very quick, they're like, oh, actually, it's just an experiment we're running on Cade and you're not actually going to hurt him. You're just going to kind of vaguely menace him around the island while we take readings. So there's never any threat at any point. But she even that kinda... doesn't work. If that doesn't even work, though. As like in terms of like in universe of this idea that they're running experiment, it's not like she sets up a series of challenges for him. And he has to get through it. She just literally just walks slowly into scenes. But you're right. There's zero threat. There's zero tension in this. So it is literally watching Cade run around in barely lit uh, areas uh, for no purpose. That's what the next 30 minutes are. It is crazy. Although one thing I did like is uh, when they both are like, oh, I can't believe we ended up in a trap. How could Nostradamus do this to us? <laughs> is that what he said? At some point, they blame Nostradamus for leading them into the trap. I'm going to use that in life from now on. Um, they try, you know, they, they're trying to find a variety of ways on leaving the island because they don't know. They think uh, yeah. Sable's going to kill them. And, like, I, I think Crazy Eddie uses his pocket computer to find a 30-year-old map, which they find a bridge, but the bridge is out because it's 30 years old. And, like, yeah. once again, Sable just shows up at the end of the bridge and starts walking toward them, so they jump off the side. And it took me a long time to figure this out, but I thought they swam off the island, but apparently they were still on the island. <laughs> It will. It was. It's a bad scene because they've set up that they're going to be able to get off because there's a. There's supposed to be a bridge. They end up jumping in the water and then it just cuts them warming up uh, by a fire. And I'm like, so they jumped into the water. She walked away and they just climbed back up and then warm themselves up, which is apparently what happened. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. They're surrounded that classic barrel fire, and Joshua drops by the barrel fire because. As we know, Joshua has mixed feelings about this. He's not sure that the Gua have a full sense of what they're getting into. So he's actually there to tell Cade about the stakes of the experiment he's in. So he's basically just like, you're here just to be tested by Lucas. Just hang out till daylight and I'll get you a ship and you can leave. And like, he like evaporates the stakes for them, kind of. Um, But then the next thing you see them, Cade and Cade and Crazy Eddie are building a Mad Max style car. For some reason? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it would have been a better episode if they hadn't had that scene and instead they sort of set it up as... uh, Cade comes onto this island and you see... You basically are told right off the beginning how isolated and how hazardous it is. And you see him going through these obstacles. And then at the very end, when he's almost defeated, Joshua says to him, oh, this was just a test. Do you think that would have been a better episode? Or do you think that would have ended up even... like, Like... Cutting the legs out from under it even worse. No, I think that would have been better in that it at least would have showed, like, that for him, there was always be stakes. And, like, at least you would have had, if it was him always escaping or, I don't know, there at least would have been plot or movement. But, like, very quickly, they, like, like we know, the audience know nothing's going to happen to him. 
and then yeah. they tell Kate himself, and then Kate, but Kate, but I guess they need the episode to continue because that's it. He's just like he's like, well, I guess I'll build a car with like I don't know. He puts like metal on it. But but one but one more thing quickly before we get to the car. Do you think also this is a product of them getting like stunt casting and getting this wrestler, but then realizing there's very little she can actually physically do? Is is that part of this? Because it feels almost like they've gotten a and and uh, excuse it, but like they've gotten like a Hulk Hogan figure, where it's like I'm gonna grab things and throw them, but that's not what happens. Is it they they had this stunt casting, but she actually can't do the things they want her to do? Or is it that she's just a bad actress? Because I, I didn't get any indication of any of that, so I'm just not sure no, I, why she's so underutilized. I don't know, because it didn't feel like it was because... Like, she's a wrestler. She has to be athletic in some ways. And, like, That's even I mean. if she's not, just have a stunt person come in and do a couple stunts. So I don't know why they got her and then did nothing with her other than have her just, like, walk to camera. It's kind of like a, the Terminator, like you said. Yeah. So anyways, it, it it doesn't matter. It's neither here nor there. But yes, they they somehow have time to I I guess what they've done is sort of souped up a car, but I don't understand how or really to what effect, but but they they've done it in sort of um like an area where all the shipping containers are sort of like around them. Sort of like making like an arena. Yeah, and you think like, okay, so they built this car, so I guess they're going to lead sable into a trap but that's not the case as soon as like sable just walks out as she always does into the middle of it and just starts like standing she didn't even walk towards him she just stands there they're like Staring. quick yeah drive at her and so they drive like eddie gets out they drive the car at her k jumps up before the car hits her like you see it's a good it's a fun effect the car like slams into her it explodes like four shipping containers maybe not four maybe two shipping containers fall over and then crush the car completely and then like out of the smoke, Sable just walks out unharmed. <laughs> yeah, because she's Terminator, and it's just like, oh, okay, well, what was the point of that? And it turns out nothing, because then she just walks behind them around the island for a little bit longer until she like, we kind of get the sense she's like lead it, like kind of not leading them somewhere, but she's corralling them, and she like pushes all these shipping containers together. And we're like, oh, I guess they're trapped now in like a square of shipping containers or something. Yeah. And then, and then, and d- d- does she attack? No, she goes to the top of the shipping containers and just stares at them again. She stares at them as they build their next trap for her. She watches the whole thing, and then Joshua That's joins right. her, and they have a conversation about like whether humans are worth saving and like whether they're actually yeah. inferior and all that stuff. And like Lucas gets mad at Joshua and is just like, you know what? I'm finishing the experiment right now, and I'm breaking the rules of the experiment. I'm going to kill Cade this time, and. She jumps down and just starts, like, slowly walking towards him. And they, like, you know, they execute this, like, plan. that They've literally been watching them put this plan together. And the plan is, it fails at first, but, it you know, it you know it's that thing. It's, like, it kind of goes wrong, but then they fix it really quickly. But essentially the plan was they were going to shine a bright light in Sable's eyes and then drop a shipping container on her. Yeah, that's basically what it is. And, and uh, through a series of uh small little events that is what happens they like home alone style drop a shipping container on her and kill her she dies like the wicked witch of the east like literally her legs are sticking out from under a shipping container and then they melt yeah but don't you think a car driving really fast exploding does more damage to someone than a shipping container falling on them well this is what i don't understand is we just saw that happen we saw a car run into her and then two full shipping containers fall on her and the car and then we just see one shipping container fall on her and that's that's it. She's dead. I was just like, it doesn't make sense. Like the thing that happened before was worse. I know it doesn't matter. The point is, she's dead. Then like Joshua w- looks at her, and I guess he's sad. That's the one thing I kind of liked about these was is just as they're about to execute the trap and like step on the button that drops the drops the shipping container, Joshua yells out to Cade, "No!" and I think you can read it as like, you know, he doesn't want him to hurt Lucas because, you know, that's his protege. That's the person he raised. But I also got the sense that Joshua, maybe because the actor puts a little more like subtext into his thing. I felt like Joshua was yelling no, because it's like, if you kill Lucas, it's not going to be good. Like, that's not going to help the cause of stopping the invasion. Like, that's what it felt like to me. Like, his no Um. seemed to have a little more subtext to it. Like, ah, no, don't do like, that's not what you're supposed to do here, Cade. I I didn't see it that way. 
I like your idea better, but I'll I'll be honest. I don't think that's what the show intended. I think I think you're giving uh, more credit to the show than it's uh, than it's it's due. But I I like that idea better. Yeah, I'm not sure. I I read a little more into it. Maybe just that actor. I'm liking him a little bit more, and yeah. I, I feel like there was more to it. But yeah, that's sort of how it ends. And of course, per his promise, Joshua gives them back a boat, and they uh you know head off into the distance and. Um, <laughs> as they're leaving as all these episodes end they end with a little voiceover by Cade and the voiceover this time is he explains the moral of the episode and the moral of this episode was <laughs> confront your fears <laughs> yeah I mean Luke, Luke that checks out I was like okie dokie I guess that's what that was about <laughs> well you know what the funny thing is I think what they're really trying to do is a sort of like brains versus brawn but they don't do that either it's not like he outsmarts her it's just, it's like a series of walking, and then they drop a shipping container on her. It's, this is, I'm telling you, this is only slightly above the uh, clip show in terms of, like, an episode of television. Like, this is barely a television episode. There's, there's, there's like, ten, 10 minutes where actual plot, and the rest is just walking around. I guess we're forgetting the quatrain that they read from Nostradamus when they figure out how to defeat uh, old Lucas. What was that? The hacking blade is a double edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that was it yeah yeah we did forget that no dramas pulled it off in the end he did it again and they're so funny they're just like they're like you know what that means don't you her quad dna is her weakness i was like what does that mean yeah I, they just yeah n- nothing nothing works in this episode it's not very good there's an interesting idea there in the conversation between joshua and lucas there's a little bit interesting backstory there's a little bit of interesting uh different uh a moral or political views about things, but it's not what they want this show to be. And it's not what this episode is at all. It's a weird bit of stunt casting that they don't use in any way. That's what this episode is. Yeah. It's really dull first season or first episode of the second season. <laughs> yeah. Now again, slightly better than a clip show, but only slightly. All right. January for the next episode. Yeah. Here's the IMDb summary for season two, episode three, the apostles. Let me ask you a question. If you could have prevented all the deaths of World War II by killing 10 innocent civilians, what would you have done? 10 people against 50 million, I guess. How about 1,000? I guess. Then you see my point. Sometimes you got to make sacrifices for the greater good. And where do you draw the line? A biker gang descends on a town, demanding the whereabouts of a person. They spot him, chase him down, and kill him. Foster investigates following Nostradamus' prediction, and finds there is more to this biker gang than meets the eye. Um, Real misdirect in there. (laughs) Yeah, I would say um, they try uh, and don't do a great job of try to trying to do like an old western for some reason yeah it's very much a western uh it starts off with this biker gang rolling into town they they meet the they meet the sheriff of the town he's like don't come into my town i'm a one uh, this one horse town that can't have these bikers and it's very funny because they're like we're looking for this guy and he's a very bad guy and we're gonna get him and like all the townspeople come out and they're just gawking at these bikers and one of the bikers says hey there he is he's just standing right there <laughs> yeah i like it yeah they basically set up like this this biker gang comes to town and they do that sort of classic Western thing where everyone in the town is sort of like watching, waiting for this shootout or something to happen. But yeah, then they're just like, there he is right there. And then they chase him. And they, uh, uh, he, it, is it like, uh, he ends up getting in a fight and he like, he's a very, he beats up most of them. And then one guy comes behind him. One of the bikers come by and just stabs him in the back and he melts, uh, alien styles. And you go, oh, they were actually, they were chasing an alien was what these, 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 this biker gang was doing. But the real turn is, after they kill the alien, the bikers yeah. gather in a circle and start chanting, Long live Cade Foster. Long live Cade Foster. Yeah, which, pretty good cold open. And I, I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little disappointed. I thought it was going to get weirder into this sort of, like, cult figure of Cade. They have, there's a little bit of that, but I thought they could have really pushed into it to a fun element of, like, this almost religion has developed around him and his exploits. I thought that was something kind of fun they could play with there, but it's more like biker gang has heard of Cade before. Yeah. It doesn't really go to that full, like the vigilantes you inspire kind of idea. Yeah. 
Yeah, because really, they don't. They I I don't know why they even chanted his name. And you know, Kate of course has heard about the biker somehow, and also found a Nostradamus quatrain, old <laughs> an old nostril quat. He's found one that matches the <laughs> circumstance. You can always find one that matches any circumstance you're in. He's always got two things open. On his left, he's got the quatrain. On his right, he's got a local newspaper, and he's just moving his head back and forth. He's looking back. He's like, any of these match up? Any of these match up? Did you did you catch the quatrain this week? No, I don't even pay attention. Iron horses blaze a vengeful trail. Oh look, it's like uh, it's iron horses. That must be must mean motorbikes. Anyway, he comes to town. He's posing as a reporter for an independent biker magazine. And once he gets there, first person he meets is the shopkeep who uh, really fills him in on what's been going on in town. Yeah, Melissa, her name is. And uh, what I like about Melissa is every time uh, someone comes uh, to her store, uh, she pulls out a shotgun. Great for business. Very good. She's she's very about safety. She doesn't want people buying too many things. Yeah, and she sort of uh, uh, updates uh, Kate on this guy, Nick, who died. And then she also uh, tells him how she's selling crystals. Um, and she basically explains that the bikers have been essentially uh, uh, coming and doing vigilante justice on people they think are bad. Um, but in terms of their view, uh, they just see the bikers like coming and killing people. Um, yeah. So so she's like, you should you should help. And he's like, oh, I'm going to go find them. Well, as a reporter for uh, Independent Biker magazine, he's got to be there on this story. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And it's just like it's I would say maybe his weakest cover he's ever had. Independent Biker Monthly, whatever it's called. It's like, uh huh. Sure. But she does tell them the biker gang has set up a camp in a barren landfill site called the Devil's Wasteland. That's right. And uh, and when you go there, it just looks like. Like a field where they've set up some trailers and they're like drinking around a fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somehow they've got all their old ladies there as well. They're all dancing around. <laughs> and but Luke, I don't know if you, but to say dancing is uh, is pretty complimentary. It's just swaying. They, they forgot to put bring music to set that day, so they're like, I don't know, just pretend something's playing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look great. Um, but so he's he's peeking on them like a real pervert, um, like a real voyeur, and uh, and immediately gets caught because he's not very good. Um, he gets caught. And they uh, bring him to the the lead biker who will become a character. I looked it up. Does not have a name. They don't ever give him a name. Um, and uh, uh, basically, they're like, uh, "What are you doing? Why are you watching us? We should kill him." Blah blah blah. Then someone very conveniently pulls out a wanted poster, and it's Cade's wanted poster. And they sort of put it against his face in classic Western style. And was like, "Wait a minute! This is Cade. This is the guy we all support." And they're like, "Hey, it's Cade. You should join us." Yeah, they give him a beer. <laughs> They give him a beer, and then they give him a motorbike. I know. They really want him in there. And we get a little explanation yeah. now. The the bikers explain that um, they're at a bar, and they killed a guy, like bikers do. But he melted. Yeah. And, of course, as you know, Jordan, having watched the episode, one of the bikers, Big Mike, he's a bit of a cyber surfer. <laughs> and he's read yeah. about this in the Paranoid Times. So uh, when they found a pocket computer in that uh, dead, melted alien's pocket, why Big Mike cracked that encryption, and they figured out to come to this town to look for more aliens. Yeah, I mean that all checks out. You know, my favorite part about that is we never meet Big Mike. I guess that's true. We don't, do we? They never say that one's Big Mike. They're just like Big Mike did this. I'm like, who's Big you Mike? You funny. I assumed it was just that tall guy who who originally caught him and who like kind of gets a couple lines. I assumed that was Big Mike, but you're right. It could have. They never really said it was. I just like there's one of them who's just like very tech savvy. Yeah. Well, someone's got to set up the internet. He's got those pocket computers. <laughs> yeah. Um. You know what I like though? At this point, Eddie calls uh, Cade and he's like, "Hey, I found the biker gangs." And Eddie's basically like, "You shouldn't hang out with them." And he's like. Well, it's like, you know, Nostradamus or whatever. And he's like, come on, man. They have criminal records. I like it. That was like his point. And I was like, yeah, so does Cade. Come on now. Don't be, don't be judge- judgmental. It's true, Cade. Just like, it's nice to have friends for once who aren't crazy Eddies. Don't leave a Airstream. Yeah, who's just writing, who's, who's just writing letters to his uh, ex-wife. <laughs> Call back. They explained to Cade that they're going to plan an attack that night on a house they suspect is also full of aliens. And, uh, you know, Cade's going to go along with them and help out. And they, they do a big home invasion. And Cade's a little off-put because it's pretty, like, you know, uh, it's violent. It's aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Well, because what it is is they just they just break into what seems like a random person's ha- house. And they're being very aggressive. And, yeah, he's sort of there, like, as a... a, a, a 
he's not so much a bystander as like an enabler. Um, and he's there and they basically like try to get the guy. He hides, he's behind, uh, he hides in the closet and they're like, come on out. And he won't come out. So then this lead biker pulls out his shotgun and shoots through the door and you hear him dissolve. And they're basically like, well, prove it to you. We're alien hunters. Yeah. And I mean, this leads to the core, um, argument of the episode the core theme of it is yeah. Cade gets in a bit of an argument with the biker leader about kind of his methods and the biker poses a thought experiment in that how many innocent lives would Cade kill to stop world war ii um a hundred Cade says yes absolutely <laughs> but when he's like a yeah. thousand Cade's is like well maybe and he keeps just like raising the number and Cade's just like i don't know how many people i'd kill to stop world war ii <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, it is an interesting idea. There's really this this idea of, like, how far would you go uh, for the ends to justify the means, right? And this guy is arguing that, yes, my means are a little bit more ruthless or a little more aggressive. Um, but 19 but million I people have, are going to die. Yeah, 19 million people. I'm saving them. And right now – and it, and it they kind of come back to it a little bit now and then because you can see kind of this guy's uh, view of Cade uh, be diminished over time because – Cade won't do anything. He's sort of just, and, and also kind of sadly as the main character in this episode, he mostly just is watching things happen, which isn't the most exciting thing to watch your lead character. But the ba- guy's basically like, I'm more effective than you. So why are, why are we chanting your name? You know? Yeah. Well, and Jordan, you say Cade doesn't do anything, but he found some crystals during that home invasion. So he calls up yeah. Eddie and says, can you go on the internet for me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. He does stuff. Yeah, uh, what I liked is uh, he calls up Eddie. And he's like, Eddie, uh, I talked to that shopkeep. She mentioned there's a lot of crystal mines in the area. That's big business here, apparently. And I found these crystals in the house we invaded. And he's just like very specifically, he's like, yeah, Eddie, I found these eight-sided quartz crystals. And immediately Eddie's just like, whoa, 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 eight-sided quartz crystals only have six sides typically. And I was just like, nobody would have that information on the top of their heads. No one would notice it was eight-sided and no one would know there were six-sided. <laughs> This is the exact thing that happened in the episode where they were, um, the aliens were trying to add like evil, evil, aggressive starting waves in the music where instead of eight tracks, there was nine tracks. Now, instead of a six sided crystal, there's an eight sided crystal. Aliens always like adding that little bit of something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Eddie ends up calling around and finding a guy who uh, sold his mine off to probably the Gua. And the guy's just like, oh, man, I wish I'd known then, but I know now. Apparently that mine produces a rare eight sided quartz crystal. And you know what you can use an eight-sided quartz crystal for, Jordan? Apparently, you can use it to help, like, your communication in your technology. Uh, they say that it uh, makes computer chips work seven times faster. There you go. It doesn't seem like that's much sticks, really. It's like, they'll go faster, you know, seven times faster. They can download much faster, Luke. Come on now. You, as we know, Jordan, from when this came out, you're going to be able to get a lot more music off Napster with those chips. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Anyway, well, Cade has been calling Eddie, telling him to look into crystals. The bikers have caught two more people they suspect of having escaped the home invasion. And, you know, Cade's, he's very upset with the violent tactics. They're beating up these two guys, trying to get them to admit mm-hmm. to being guas. And, you know, one of them, they pull up and he's like, they're they're yelling at him. And he's like, oh, I don't know. We don't know if he's a human or a gua, but they just kill him. And it turns out he is a gua. He like melts away. And then they look at the other one. They're like, well, you must be a Gua too. But when they stab that guy, he dies like a regular human. They're like, oops, well, that one, uh, you've got to break a couple eggs, I guess. Well, that's what it is. Like, they do actually show, like, the biker sort of looks, not embarrassed, but you can see that he's like, well, we did make a mistake. But, again, He does look embarrassed. He's like, well, that's egg on my face. Yeah. So he was, he's like, he realizes it was a mistake, but he's also like, you know, I, I, yeah, you're right. You got to crack a couple eggs, you know? <laughs> And, of course, so we can tie this back to the rest of the episode, the shopkeeper, for whatever reason, has decided to also come and, like, spy on the bikers in the Devil's Playground or wherever they are. She's better at hiding, though. She doesn't get caught. So what she sees is she sees a gua die, a man melts away in front of her eyes, and then she sees a regular townsperson she knows also get brutally murdered. Yeah, so she goes to the sheriff. And the sheriff's been kicking around this episode. He's mostly been, like, trying to calm the townspeople down, promising if things escalate, he'll call the National Guard, that kind of thing. And she gets there, and she's just like, I saw a guy die. I saw a guy melt. We need to call and help. We have to. And he's just like, don't worry. Reinforcements are coming. But what's more important here is I don't think you saw a guy melt. I'm definitely not an alien, but I don't think a guy melted. For sure, there wasn't an alien there. 
Yeah, and I don't know if there was just a hole in my notes or I just uh, blacked out from boredom. But very quickly here, the bikers come back and kidnap Melissa, right? Yeah, it's basically Cade's kicked out of the gang. He also comes back to town, finds the same sheriff who also is just like, I promise reinforcements are coming. Like, he's so clearly telegraphing he's an alien at this point. It's like annoying. Um, yeah. And Cade's like, okay, thanks. I'm glad those reinforcements that you won't name are coming. And then Cade leaves the sheriff's station. And as soon as he steps outside, he looks over and he sees the shop that uh, Melissa works at. And the bikers are dragging her out. And he's just like, he walks over. He's like, hey, what are you guys doing? And they're like, oh, we found she sells crystals in there. So she must be an alien. So we're going to go kill her. And he's just like, oh, well, please don't do that. And they're like, no, nah, we're going to. Yeah. So they, I think they beat him up at that point and like leave him in the dust. Um, but then he just... The next scene is, like, he's recovered, and he just shows up at the camp with, like, sunglasses and a gun. Yeah, we end up doing, like, it's, like, two or three locations now. And essentially what it boils down to is, like, Cade chases them there, and the sheriff chases them there. And then they get in a gunfight, and Cade saves Melissa. And then they jump in their cars again and do another another chase sequence back to town. And when they get back to town, the biker's just, like... Well, there's only one way to settle this. Biker rules. And they get in a fist fight. By the way, this is the second time in of in this podcast we've watched a show where people have settled things with biker rules. Do you remember this? <laughs> what was the other one? Probably, um, I want to say Auto Gemini Man. Man. Oh, Auto Man. <laughs> Auto Man. Auto Man, they also settled things biker rules. Remember? He had to... Um, a biker rules were doing a series of hilarious obstacles with their motorbike to prove that you're the best biker. Well, it works this time, too, because Cade, like beats up the lead biker, knocks him unconscious, and all the other bikers just get on their motorcycles and drive their separate ways. The biker gang's over. Yeah, that's it. I mean, those are biker rules. Anyway, at this point, the sheriff who was, like, involved in this chase and the gunfight and everything, he pulls up suddenly, and uh, he's helping Susan or Melissa or whatever the shopkeep's name is up, and uh, Cade looks at him and he's just like, wait, weren't you shot in the arm at that earlier gunfight? It's all healed now. You're an alien. And Cade pulls out his gun and he's like, Susan, Melissa, whatever your name is, get out of the way. I'm going to blow that guy's brains out. And she's just like, what are you talking about? Like, why would you kill him? Like, he's the sheriff. I know him. He's not anyone bad. He's our friend. And Kate does a really bad job of making his case. Yeah, because he has the gun on them and he's basically like, he's an alien. But like, yeah, he just, I don't know. I guess there was another way to go about it. But like, he doesn't know. He can't shoot because he doesn't want to accidentally hit Melissa. But then uh, the biker makes the decision for him and just starts shooting and ends up hitting Melissa, uh, killing her. And then um, the alien sheriff jumps in the car and drives away. Not before he shoots and fatally wounds the biker. though. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So everyone who deserved it got it. This is what I mean by that la- like last scene where Melissa's trying to be like, why are you trying to shoot this man? He's the sheriff. K just went through an adventure where the lesson he was learning is the ends don't justify the means and you can't just kill people randomly. And like, yes, he knows that the sheriff's an alien, but like he's just the, his first instinct is just to blow his brains out in front of this woman who doesn't know. She doesn't know there are aliens. Hmm. Yeah. So I, it just didn't feel like he learned anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I mean, and the important thing is that she got killed. I mean, it's not important to anyone. He didn't learn anything from that either. No. And then, and then Cade drives away on his motorbike. And my favorite part of maybe both these episodes is he's like, he, and I know this is not exactly what he says, but he's just like, yeah, things happen. I don't know. I guess, I guess you could blame God. Not that I believe in God. And I was like, whoa, 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 no. I don't think God has anything to do with what's just happened here, Cade. You've really just bungled things up. And that's how they end the episode. Yeah. That final voiceover where he's driving away is just like, do the ends justify the means? Nostradamus would say no. So I'm not going to shed any more innocent blood. Yeah. She's like, okay. Then he drives away. And I'll say, not a great episode, but better than the last one. At least stuff happened in this. Yeah, that's fair. It's definitely a step up from that weird, weird uh, episode one. Uh, I have no idea. At least this was an episode. (laughs) At least it was an episode of television as opposed to quite literally a just woman walking around and then occasionally seeing her in her bra that was the previous episode all right jordan you have any final notes you want to get into writings i think we just write this puppy all right how do you feel about the pi or not the pilot the first episode of season two target 117 i mean it's not really an episode of television i can only uh rank 10 minutes of it so two to ten two out of ten 
<laughs> it's not an episode of television. It's literally just watching someone walk around. It's not TV. Yeah, it's it's pretty rough. It's um such a weird one to restart after you've done your finale of the clip show. It was like not an improvement. Yeah. Uh I don't know. I also am a little torn. I think there's a one good explosion, and like I liked seeing Sable. It was like once I realized who that was, I was like, "Oh, good for Sable." I gave it two points. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go two point five. Okay, two point five. Yeah, that's fair. And then there's the Apostles, Jordan. Uh, Apostles, not a great episode, and I I'm hoping this is not the trajectory the show is on because it seems like it's getting worse um, as time is going on. But it might also just be that we're watching it. And, you know, we were just you know it's getting a little long in the tooth but i do think this was a better episode than the last one not one of their best i've seen but i'm gonna give it a four and a half out of ten. Four and a half. yeah i mean an ends just by the means episode is perfectly reasonable as an episode to do but the plot of this episode doesn't really work it just like no. to be the people who are like the ones trying to teach us lesson just be like a gang of ruthless bikers there's not like there's no morality in that it's like yeah our this murdering biker gang are they good? It's like, no, they were never good. Like, this is not a people you can look to for, like, a moral lesson. Yeah. I mean, it could have even been a thing where he comes into this small town and he sees that they've been effectively killing, like, normal townsfolk have been killing aliens and doing it quite effectively, but also ruthlessly occasionally killing their own people. Um, and maybe there was a thing there where it's just like, well, these are just everyday people doing what they have to do under uh extreme circumstances but yeah by making it a biker gang it seemed like almost they were letting themselves off the hook yeah and i think that i think the thing that might have worked i like that premise like the townsfolk like it's humans who are ruthless killers and they're all like good people just trying to stop this thing Mm -hmm. but i think the thing that doesn't work is just like yes you're not going to kill your own kind like obviously that's that's a that's a no-brainer like what needed to happen is they needed to be like torturing or doing something to the gua it was too much right, for even right. even Cade. Yeah, stomach, you're right. right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, he should have. It should have been like, um, uh, uh, yeah, they should have been like being tortured or they're enslaved or something like that. And it's like, well, you guys are just as bad as they are now. That sort of thing. You're right. That would have made it better. Um, I'm gonna give it a four. Yeah, we're very close on these. Yeah, we're not too far off. I think we we watched the same two episodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now, Luke, how far are we? Are, do we have to check where our scores are in the Continuum Drag computer? We do. We got to open up the computer <laughs> computer and see uh, see how close we are to the escape pod. Because I don't know, man. It's it's leaning hard. Yeah. We talked about this before, I think, uh, last week um, uh, off, the, off the air, um, that we probably weren't going to take the escape pod. But I, I don't know. These were some pretty weak episodes. I would say the first episode, the first like kind of three episodes we watched... I think we gave pretty reasonable scores to like there were sevens in there for yeah. sure. And then that season finale was just a disaster. We really knocked it down. <laughs> and yeah. that and then these, of season these two have not helped is it. not helping. Yeah. So let's see where we're at. All right, Jordan, the computer is spitting out the number now. Yeah. It is 4.54. Oh, we're taking the escape pod. We're going to take the escape pod. I'm a little surprised. I thought we'd make it to season three, but now we're just going to jump right to the finale, I guess. You know what? It kind of makes sense. And uh, part of me is uh, a little sad that we're not going to see more. But also, these were just really bad. I think it's fair. Like, these were bad, bad episodes of television. They were really bad. And it's so funny. It feels like, despite all the things that make it kind of cheesy and weird it feels like there's something fun in this premise and we saw glimpses of it at times but like the last three episodes have been just straight trash like i'd almost argue that even though it was a bit of a mess the pilot was i think in retrospect i can't remember what my score was but i think it might have been the best episode where it was just like balls to the wall like scene scene something crazy is happening ah, like does it make sense it doesn't matter it's fun and it was like it was a i think both of us said like it was a fun 45 minutes. You just sat down and like let it just wash over you. These are like kind of boring, which I think is the worst thing it could be, especially for a show that doesn't have that much to it. It's like, guys, don't take yourself so seriously. Just have a fun episode. And it's like they're desperate to not be fun for some reason. Yeah, I mean, even the hospital episode, it's not a great piece of television, but like at least it was dark and it was contained and like you're in a scary yeah. hospital where, where experiments were being tortured on. Like there was a lot of fun to be had in that episode 
that really even even the Rockstar episode, like the best part was the music. It wasn't that fun. Yeah. Yeah. But these were these were just some bad episodes. So so well, at least we're gonna see what season three is like. Can you imagine if we hadn't watched what I could determine to be the top three episodes? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? But who knows? Maybe maybe they were the best episodes. I mean, there's no way that this episode of walking down the thing, uh, just walking in in uh, on an island, was the best episode. But that's what the ra- rankings are, or ratings, or whatever. I do wonder if maybe inadvertently fans of the show are skewing episodes. Like a season finale is always going to be a high octane one, you think, or like a yeah. season premiere. And I wonder if that's just maybe skewing the ratings slightly somehow. Like, because they're, you know. Those are legitimately like some of the worst. Like, there's just no way all the other episodes are as bad. I can't imagine the episodes are as bad as these two episodes. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe it's something we have to uh, uh, consider when we do a multi-season uh, show again. Is kind of consider some of these rankings and maybe pick them in a different way. Yeah, I don't know. I'll go back to the drawing board. But whew, yeah. uh, a rough, rough period. Good news though. But anyways, if you're a fan of First Wave and you don't think we've seen enough of it yet, it's not over. We didn't give it a fair shake. It's not yeah. over. You can donate to bonus episodes for charity. $50 to one of the charities picked by our past guests. You can go to our uh, social media. There'll be links there to it. Or go right to the website, continuumdrag.podbean.com, and go to the uh, bonus episodes for charity link up top. You can figure out how to do it. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to email us here at continuumdrag at gmail.com and we'll provide you with explanations uh, on how to get that done. And of course, that email works for anything you want to send our way. Um, it's uh, have, always happy to hear from you. That's what I think I'm trying to say. Yeah. And yeah, and it can be any show. You can Any show that we never finished, you can you can pick an episode. Yeah, we read all about it on, uh, on the website. Luke's favorite. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> At any rate, you can also see clips from these episodes of First Waves at uh, Continuum Drag on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, so you'll see some clips from these episodes. More Definitely more people getting, uh, what do you call it, uh, shipping containers dropped on them. Yeah. There'll be uh, at least one case of someone becoming goo and dissolving. Absolutely. We can't get through an episode of this without doing yeah. that. <laughs> and that about wraps it up. So, uh Listener, thank you for joining joining us. And Jordan, long live Kate Foster. Long <laughs> live Kate Foster. <laughs> Pretty good. See ya. Bye. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario, and Seoul, South Korea. Theme music by James Rick Seedler. Produced by Jordan Dalek and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Younes. <laughs>